Friends, the message you are about to hear, God Bless America, by evangelist Paul J. Stewart, was printed in the Congressional Record, Washington, D.C., March 14, 1955, volume 101, page A, 1729. At that time, Congressman the Honorable Carl Elliott stood up in the House of Representatives and spoke thus, quote, Mr. Speaker, in November of last year, I had the opportunity of attending a Veterans Day service. At that time, Evangelist Paul J. Stewart delivered a message on God Bless America, which I thought contained some fundamental truths for our times." End quote. Here is Evangelist Paul J. Stewart. In Psalms, the 67th Division, God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. That thy ways may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God, let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. God bless America was one of the most popular slogans, mottos, and songs of the Second World War. It swung in our churches, towered from our skyscrapers, decked our college chapels, and adorned our Senate houses. It was stamped on emblems and woven in the banners. It swept the highways on automobile windshields, soared through the trackless blue on airline transports, and plied the seven seas with our merchant marines. It's an indelible and undeniable fact that God has blessed America. 
the God of eternity, the God of history, and the God of infinity, hold the destiny of nations in the palm of his hand. The intelligent and benevolent providence of God is clearly and plainly revealed and manifested in that he reserved and preserved a magnificent continent of immeasurable and inexhaustible resources down across the ages until he had a prepared people to possess and populate it. While Homer sang, Hannibal fought, and Rome rose and fell, the mighty Mississippi rolled majestically toward the Gulf of Mexico, unseen by civilized and Christianized man. The great Rocky Mountains towered to the skies, unknown and unsung. The broad acres of the western prairies were uncultivated and unharvested. The cotton fields of Alabama, the wheat fields of Kansas, the gold mines of Colorado, the coal fields of Pennsylvania, and the oil wells of Texas were undiscovered and unutilized. This vast unlimited reservoir of resources was the sole possession of a few uncouth and untutored savages. This miracle of preservation is nothing short of the gracious purpose of God in reserving an adequate place for God to build a final and ultimate civilization. At last a prepared people landed on the eastern shores of America. The clock of history on the walls of eternity struck the hour of destiny, and a new civilization climbed above the western horizon. From the smoldering empires of Europe, across the watery waste of the trackless deep, in 1620 came our Puritan fathers, who believed in the open Bible. They landed in their Mayflower at Plymouth Rock, and there along New England's rock-bound shore laid the foundation of the greatest nation beneath the gleaming sun of day and the glinting stars of night. American history reads like a romance, sounds like a doxology, and looks like a panorama, a bewitching and bewildering glory. What Canaan was to the old world, America is to the new world. The God who led the children of Israel with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night has guided and guarded America with his unerring eye and untiring hand. There have been tense and crucial moments in our history, but God has blessed and protected America. In the past, America has honored God, and God has honored America. The infant republic was born in prayer. The Constitution was founded in prayer. The Declaration of Independence was signed in prayer. The ship of state was launched in prayer. The Bible is the basis of our Constitution, the foundation of our government, the source of our laws, and the sheet anchor of our liberties. Throughout the length and the breadth of the land, we find the signature and the handwriting of God. His words are written into our state papers, quoted by our statesmen, imprinted on our money, and echo in the songs we sing, the literature we read, and the aspirations of our people. It is this in the past that's put character into our statesmen, courage into our soldiers, justice into our government, and conscience into our people. Yes, in the past, we honored God, and God has honored us. And yet today, God is still blessing and honoring America. America has sinned, but the God of compassionate mercy and abounding grace is still guarding and protecting 
and preserving America. One would have to be so blind that he could not see lightning, and so deaf that he could not hear thunder, and so paralyzed that he could not feel an earthquake, to not recognize the blessings of God upon America today. America is the flower barrel of the economical world, the arsenal of democracy, the greatest military power in the assembly of nations, and the lighthouse of spiritual illumination and salvation for the whole world. America is the richest country in all the world. We have enough wood to house the world, enough coal to heat the world, enough corn to feed the world, enough cotton to clothe the world, and enough sugar to sweeten the world. Thank God for the United States of America. Benjamin Franklin was dining with a small group of distinguished gentlemen in Paris. One of the group said, there are three nationalities represented here this evening. I am French. My friend here is English, and Benjamin Franklin is an American. Let each of us propose a toast. It was agreed to, and the Englishman who was accorded first honors in the tone of a Briton bowl said, Here's to Great Britain, the sun that gives light to all nations of the earth. The Frenchman was somewhat taken back at this, but he proposed, here's to France, the moon whose magic rays move the tides of the world. Benjamin Franklin then arose with an air of quaint modesty and said, here's to our beloved George Washington, the Joshua of America, who commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, and they obeyed. The story is told that a soldier boy, battle-scarred, and homesick was on a ship returning to America. As the ship glided in the harbor, he looked up and he saw the Statue of Liberty. Old gal, he said, I'm mighty proud to see you. But sister, if you ever expect to see me again, you will have to turn around, for I never want to leave America one more time. Many years ago, a wise philosopher came to our country, seeking the secret of the greatness and genius of America. This was his answer. I saw for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, but it was not there. I saw for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields, and her boundless forests, and it was not there. I saw for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I saw for the greatness and genius of America in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. A South American statesman was asked by a citizen of North America for an explanation of the difference between the progress and civilization and that of our neighbors to the south of us. His answer was a classic. I suppose it is because North America was settled by pilgrims in search of God, while South America was settled by soldiers in search of gold. From our humble, inconspicuous, and unpretentious beginnings of 13 struggling colonies, today we have the greatest nation in all the world, 
composed of 50 states, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean and from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. All this is beautifully and artistically revealed in the emblem, the symbol, the banner, the star-spangled banner, old glory, as she waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. The flag is the one and only symbol that holds this great republic together. In it, every one of the 50 states can see itself in its own particular star. And in the 13 stripes of red and white, they all may see the 13 struggling and hard-pressed colonies out of which this mighty nation came. The starry flag eloquently proclaims the birth and the life and the progress of this the greatest republic of all time and of all history. Betsy Ross, out of a heart of love and liberty and loyalty, stitched and sewed the first American flag. The stars and stripes became the symbol of our unity, our honor, our ideals, our aspirations as a nation, a banner of victory, the sum and substance of everything that America stands for. Thank God for the stars and stripes. Sleep on, Betsy Ross, and may your ashes rest in peace beneath the pure white gleaming stars that your weary fingers first stitched and sewed into the American flag. And you generals, admirals, captains, lieutenants, sergeants, corporals, soldiers, sailors, marines, pilots, and gunners, who in nearly ever land in all seven seas have paid the supreme sacrifice of love and devotion to God and country. Many of you buried on foreign lands and in foreign seas. We cannot place a flower upon your graves today, but we can salute this glorious flag for which you gave your all, for which you fought and bled and died on land and sea to keep this banner flying. Let Egypt have its standard, Rome its emblem, England its Union Jack, and Russia its hammer and sickle. But for these United States, it is the stars and stripes forever. Let it float not only from arsenal and masthead, but from tower and steeple, from public edifice, temples of science, private dwellings, and places of worship. Let us twine each thread of the glorious tissues of our country's flag about our heartstrings, and let us resolve, come weal or woe, we will in life or in death stand by the stars and stripes. They have been unfurled from the snows of Canada to the sun-kissed plains of New Orleans, from Alaskan Gulf to the Great Lakes, from Mexico to the Canadian border, from the Golden Gate where the sun retires to bid the world good night, to the ice-capped mountains of the north, where northern lights unfold in rainbow flame across the polar skies and kindle bonfires among the clouds. From sea to shining sea, it flings out the starry banner, the flag of hope, the flag of home, the flag of religious freedom, conceived in the wombs of a freedom-loving nation, cradled to the tomb of a free democracy, wedded to the principles and purposes of justice and equity for all. America, no land in all the world is like thee. No government built on greater fundamentals. No people born to greater liberty and freedom. And no flag in all the earth more glorious. America was built upon fundamental and imperishable convictions, standards, and principles. As we associate beauty with the Greeks, civil law with the Romans, 
ritualism with the Jews. So we associate liberty and freedom with the United States of America. In 1620, it was a free soul. In 1776, it was a free soil. In 1812, it was a free sea. In 1863, it was a free people. In 1896, it was a free hemisphere. In 1918, it was a free democracy. And God grant that it shall forever be the land of the free and the home of the brave. When we think of the millions today in Europe and behind the Iron Curtain, under the tyrannical heel of a cruel dictatorship, we ought to thank God for the American flag and the liberty it guarantees to all the citizens of the United States of America. We still enjoy in this country the inalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuits of happiness. We still have the constitutional rights of freedom of speech, freedom of press, the priceless privilege of peaceful assembly, and petition for redress of grievances. We have the inalienable rights to vote for God, home, and native land. We have religious freedom. We can worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and no man dare to molest or to make afraid. If any alien nation should ever capture the United States, it would take away the natural God-given and constitutional rights and privileges of the people. How earnestly all should pray. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. America has the greatest system of government in all the world. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Most places today the accused are guilty until they are proven innocent. But the convictions, standards, and principles that have made America great emphasize that man is innocent until he is proven guilty. America is known around the world today as a land of unlimited opportunity. No child in this nation who has the ambition is deprived of even a college education. The humblest citizen may rise to the highest position and the poorest man may climb to the highest pinnacle of financial, industrial, and economical success. Where else in all the world do the doors of the church swing wide open as they do here in the United States of America? Old Rome believed in the church ruling over the state. The figure of speech is that of a big bossy woman ruling over a little hen-pecked husband. England swung to the other extreme, the state ruling over the church. The figure of speech is that of a big blustering husband towering over a little frail nervous wife who is afraid of her shadow. But America has taken the correct middle of the road position on the subject, the separation of church and state, or making the two different institutions friendly next door neighbors. God never meant for the church and the state to be wedded together in matrimony. And those whom God hath put asunder, let no man put together. God meant for the church and the state to be good next door neighbors and cooperate together as good neighbors always do. And today in America, we can worship God according to dictates of our own conscience without interference, disturbance, or molestation. In other lands, if preachers preach the truth, they are thrown in concentration camps or face a firing squad. In the United States, 
while we preach the truth, we have the protection and the preservation of the police force and the government on our side. Daniel Webster said, if we abide by the principles taught in the Bible, our country will go on prospering and continue to prosper. But if we in our posterity neglect its instructions and authority, no man can tell how sudden a catastrophe may overwhelm and bury our glory in profound obscurity. Roger Babson said, it is the church which has created America, developed our schools, created our homes, built our cities, and done everything that's worthwhile in America today. Today we face red communistic Bolshevik anti-God Russia. In the early days of America, we were confronted with enemies remarkably similar in principle to those whom we face today. Our ships were attacked by the French fleets. Our commerce were virtually cut off. Our liberties were threatened by European dictatorship. Our peace and security were menaced. In that emergency, President John Adams, the second president of these United States, did what we've always done in times of emergency. He enlarged the army, created a strong navy, and instituted a firm defense program. But he also went further. He issued a presidential proclamation requesting a day of solemn humiliation, fasting, and prayer. That the citizens of these United States, abstaining from their customary worldly occupation, offer their devout addresses to the Father of mercies. The nation fell on its knees and confessed its sins, both national and individual. The record is that war was averted, peace was established, and a long period of prosperity began. Today, we need guns, but we need God more than we need guns. We need cannons, but we need Christ more than cannons. We need bombs, but we need the Bible more than bombs. We need powder, but we need prayer more than powder. We need tanks, but we need truth more than we need tanks. We need grenades, but we need the gospel more than we need grenades. We need atomic bombs, but we need the atoning blood of Christ more than we need atomic bombs. We need cash, but we need Christian character more than we need cash. May we so honor God in America today that God will continue to bless America so that our children and grandchildren and their posterity might live in the same kind of an America that we enjoy and appreciate today.
my home, sweet home, from the mountains to the prairies to the ocean, white with home. 